let's get started. All right. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Welcome to the Nick Beck Endowed Investigative Lecture Series. This is produced in association with the Los Angeles City College <coughs> Foundation. We're pleased to present Frank Buckley and Lisa Napoli in a discussion on journalism and the birth of the 24-hour news cycle. Before we begin, just a couple of uh, uh, points of order for this program. It's a 60 minute conversation. And then we're gonna open the uh, chat room for questions for the last 30 minutes, if we've got folks that have questions. And we will either field those questions and present them to our guest speakers, or we will allow them to go ahead and do those themselves. So without any further ado, let me go ahead and do our introductions. Our first uh, guest is Frank Buckley, who is known to most folks in the LA area as the morning news anchors, one of the morning news anchors for KTLA Channel 5. He's also the host and executive producer of Frank Buckley Interviews, a 30 minute television show and podcast airing on weekends on KTLA and on YouTube along with other various platforms. He also has the television show on Sunday mornings on KTLA and other stations um, called Inside California Politics on KTLA, it's usually shown at 5.30 a.m. and 4 p.m., but check your local stations for any other um, showings of that. And we just want to also say Frank is a proud sponsor of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and we would be remiss if we did not wish him a happy belated birthday. Yesterday was his birthday, so congratulations in celebrating your annual 39th birthday, Frank. <laughs> uh, our guest... Other guest and author is Lisa Napoli. Uh, Lisa is an established journalist and author and former NPR contributor. Uh, Ms. Napoli has worked in journalism covering presidential campaigns, the Waco hostage standoff, outdoor hackers convention, the then emerging culture of the internet and digital technology, and all the wide varieties of news outlets, some which no longer exist, including the New York Times, Cyber Times, MSNBC, and the public radio show Marketplace. Um, in 2016, Ms. Napoli published her second book, which was called Ray and Joan, The Man Who Made the McDonald's Fortune and The Woman Who Gave It All Away. In the same year, the movie The Founder, starring Michael Keaton came out. That movie focused the spotlight on Ray Kroc, the man who amassed a fortune as the chairman of McDonald's. But Ms. Napoli's book focused on his wife, Joan, the woman who became famous for giving away his fortune, she tells a fascinating story behind this historic couple. Her third and fourth book, she turned to media history. Uh, Up All Night with Ted Turner, um, CNN and the making of the 24 hour news, looks at the original story of the world's first all news cable channel. Tonight's focus will be on Up All Night, which was published in 2020. We are pleased to share the news that her latest book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki is the story of the founding mothers of NPR, wrapped around the emergence of public radio and second wave of feminism in the 70s. Her book will be released this spring. Ms. Um, Ms. Napoli uh, led an award-winning volunteer cooking group with the Downtown Women's Center on Skid Row in Los Angeles, and she supports, supports a number of charitable causes, including the founding board member of the Bhutan Media Services. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Buckley and Lisa Napoli. Kevin, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, we're live in my living room uh, in, in Studio City. Lisa, lovely to see you again. So nice to see you. Thank you, Frank, and happy birthday. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, really difficult turning 39 this year. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to see that you've uh, taken your cat filter off because, uh, <laughs> you know, we can't have another one of those this week. Yeah, that's been uh, done already, so, yeah, yeah. I, I also intend to remain seated throughout uh, the webinar. Uh, you'll be happy to know I am wearing a proper pants, um, not PJ bottoms or, or worse. And I'm sure that all of you, wherever you are, are uh, properly attired as well. But it, <laughs> it, it all goes to illustrate, though, this, this crazy year that uh, we, we've been experiencing um, in news, in technology, uh, careers have been made and, and destroyed because some people didn't wear pants. Um, 
The pandemic has uh, meant for us a number of changes in our business, in the news business, uh, how we cover the news, the uh, technology platforms we use to gather the news. And it, it seems to me that it's all part of this continuing evolution of, of the news business. And I think that's the correct word because it suggests a gradual development of something from the simple to the more complex. And if you think about the history of news, um, I think in many ways it is more complex than ever, um, both from the consumer side, uh, people who read or watch or, or listen to the news yes. get it in so many different ways now. And, and while I made a, a, a joke about a, a cat filter, um, news consumers have been left to filter their news as it comes to them from so many and so many varied sources. Um, and we can get into some of that later this evening. But with regard to the evolution of news and news coverage, certainly CNN is worthy of at least one really good book about CNN and its place in the history of TV news. And that's what we have with Lisa Napoli's book, Up All Night, Ted Turner, CNN, and the Birth of 24-Hour News. And Lisa, once again, congratulations on a terrific uh, a book, a, a great history, but also something that was just fun to read. Did you have fun writing it? I did. And thank you so much. That's such a generous introduction, Frank. And you know, you have the courage to keep waking up in the middle of the night to go to work and working constantly. I don't know how you keep up with all the things that you do and do them so well. I just, a few years ago, well, about a decade ago, just decided I had a go into history and write long form books because I was so exhausted from the news business. And that was before Twitter took over news and, and you know, the, the cycle was 24 seven, of course, as it has been for 40 years, but I, I just, I was wiped out. So I do love digging into the history because, you know, especially here in Southern California and where you work in particular, there is so much rich history of the media that I, and it may be a matter of getting older or just a matter of, I don't know, exhaustion, that I love looking at where all of this came from. Like what we're doing right now, what it took to do what we're doing right now, um, decades ago when KTLA was first starting was just impossibly complicated and required so many people. So yeah, it's fun. It's fun to dig into history. And I wish that I had understood how great history was back when I was younger and going to school because I might have become a historian. But yeah. Yeah, there you are. No, it, it is interesting because the way we cover news, even in, in the time that I've been doing it in Los Angeles, I came to LA in, as a, as a full-time reporter in 1992 when I went to KCAL. And when I was on the street reporting, we thought we were such a big deal when we would do driving live shots. We <laughs> would set up our microwave mast and, and line it up to Mount Wilson or whatever repeater we were trying to hit. And they would tell us in the control room, go. And then we would slowly drive to make sure that we continued to hit the, 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 the repeater. And we <laughs> thought we were so cool going live as we were you know, driving, and now our reporters do it, you know, every day. Um, and iPhone, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, you know, I was live from the Arabian Sea and and the Persian Gulf on on board aircraft carriers, and so it's it's ch changed just even in the last you know 10, 20 years. Um, and you, I, I just want you to explain that for anybody who's watching who might not have ever done what you did. I mean, that was dangerous. That mast was not, it wasn't uncommon for it to hit something and for somebody yeah. to die, right? Without being in the Arabian Sea, just on some street, Sunset Boulevard, right? I mean, yeah. it was yeah. complicated and expensive too. Right, I mean, when, when we go live in a truck and, and honestly, now you don't really need it, but we used to have to put the mast up and uh, direct it and there was, and there's still some of that, but, but as you know, now, as you said, you can pick up your phone and go live and, and broadband things in and it's, it's changed so much. But to your point about KTLA in particular, my station, first TV station, many people don't realize this, the first station west of the Mississippi and we have a very proud news tradition. And you write about that in chapter one of your book, which I was really surprised. You, uh, you suggest that the birth of TV news in the sense of 24-hour news coverage is not CNN. 
it's it's an event that KTLA covered. Um, I wonder if you could tell people about that. Yeah, no, it happened right here in San Marino. And it took a tragic event of a little girl falling down a well, which seemed so improbable because it wasn't very wide. She wasn't very big. She was just a toddler. And she literally went out in her backyard and fell down this well. Her mother was frantic, called the police. The police blotter or, or scanner uh, was sort of an alarm to reporters as well as to technicians who flocked to the scene to help her. And your then news director, long before you arrived on the scene, uh, was a man named Klaus Landsberg, who was incredibly innovative and just loved the technology. And that's the cool part of the story, too, is that there's something for everyone. If you're an engineer, as Klaus was, really, that was at his core what he was. He then later became a showman and a newsman. He realized that this was an incredibly interesting human interest story that people would want to know about a little girl in a well. Everybody can relate to that. And so he dispatched a crew, um, which now, you know, people at your workplace do routinely without question or thinking about it, but then there wasn't really much of a news organization or operation at KTLA. Everybody was still just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And he dispatched a crew, I think they were at a wrestling match. It was on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and, and he dispatched them, I, I think it's, I have to remember correctly if it was Saturday. He, he sent them to this uh, location and they had to figure out how to go live from the scene. Even before he sent them, he just knew it was an important thing to try to cover. And that was the first time that um, we know of that somebody tried to do that. And just to put a fine point on it, there weren't that many televisions in the Los Angeles market. So it's not like now where, whoa, something happened, turn on the tube if it wasn't on already. Um, basically, there, people had to go to appliance stores uh, and stand outside of appliance stores and beg the guy inside to keep the TV on <laughs> so they could watch this unfolding drama. And the, the news people didn't really know what to do. They were sort of lost. You know, what do we do or say now, of course, somebody in your position knows exactly what to do when there's an emergency and how you fan out. So yeah, it was a very interesting moment in time when I read about that. And I thought this is something that people need to, to think about and know, because it made me start to think about just that that impulse, that impulse to know what's going on in your community has always been there. It's just that the means to know, to tap into it hasn't always been. And Klaus Lounsberg was you know, wise enough to try to rig this gear and it was a real rig. It was a tough rig um, to make it happen. Yeah. Um, another person who was uh, uh, instrumental in that moment was uh, the late Stan Chambers. Um, can you talk to us about how he was involved in that? And to your point about, you know, you would know what to do today. I have to say that when I first started working as a street reporter in LA, one of the first people I encountered on a a story at a breaking news story was Stan Chambers. Wow. And he was, you know, the, the man that people know from TV was the man he was in person. And he, I was at a competing station. He introduced himself and he said, that's the public information officer over there. And, you know, if you, you know, he was, he was just a gentle man. Oh. Um, and uh, it was such a, an honor to work with him, but, but talk to us about Stan back then and, and how he, what did he do? How did he know how to cover that story? Well, and, and for anybody who is watching who may not know who Stan Chambers was, as Frank is saying, he was a legend in, in broadcasting. He was just starting out. I think he was just out of USC when he sort of fell into KTLA and um, was desperate to be on the air. And, uh, you know, as I say, there wasn't a whole, it wasn't like there was a whole news department the way there is now. And he started as an announcer and he was begging 
for the chance to do to be to be on the air and some people felt i think it was something about the makeup the makeup was strange the tubes were strange in television the lighting and you know not everybody you know could be all glammed up the way well not if not everybody can be glammed up even now but <laughs> he uh he was really eager to make his way in front of the camera and would do anything and everybody says that he was just the nicest, most solid person. And I think he was emceeing some B'nai B'rith event or something that morning on behalf of KTLA, going out into the community the way you do, like way you're doing now from your living room. And he was hosting this event when they, when he got the call from back at headquarters to come. And literally it was a call on a corded phone that somebody handed to him in the, in the, Biltmore down here, not far from where I am. And he uh, rushed out to the scene. I think somebody had to drive him because he was living with his mother. He was a young guy. He didn't have much of anything. And he went out there and basically Klaus told him, okay, work it. Like, find out what's going on. There's there's a massing crews of people coming from all over, volunteers and professionals to help in the service of finding this little, getting this little girl out of the well. And he literally didn't know what to do. He writes about this in his memoir. Um, So Klaus said, go out and go around with a microphone and talk to people. And that's what he did. And um, he brought people to the scene and he was so trusted. He and his colleague were so trusted uh, because of the way they conducted themselves in this incredibly grave moment. Uh, that they that the police turned to the announcers to make the the announcement that the little girl had been found dead. Um, it actually, they they dispatched them to the parents because they were so trusted in that moment. And it just gives me chills to think about how at the beginning of broadcasting, television was just a few years old yeah. at this point. Um, Even then, it was obvious from the very beginning how powerful broadcasters were in communicating to their communities and what an incredible responsibility. I mean, you have it. You must maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, my goodness, I I have this immense power to chart the course of something. And certainly in that case, you know, to, to deal with a bereft family and all of the viewers and all the people on the scene who were feeling bereft in that moment because they felt this immediate connection to this family even if they didn't know the family or the girl. So I think I love that story even though it isn't directly connected to CNN because it really sets the scene for where we are today in the always on universe because it it was a first hint of how television could be um, always on in terms of following an event as it unfolded and not knowing how it's going to turn out, but people being riveted to it the way they would be to sports or yeah. something else. Well, and, and to your point, I think that TV has the power. And you know, now I, 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 I don't think that TV is unique in this. Now I think you can get it on a variety of sources where we can take you there live. The one thing that newspapers do well is they provide context, perspective, analysis, because they have the, the luxury, at least they used to have, they'll have the luxury of time to really work a story. And then you'd wake up in the morning and read it in the paper. Of course, now they're under as, as much pressure as we are in some ways. But right. what we do really well is we show you a live picture and we can say, here's what's happening. Take a look. Now I will try to provide you pr- some perspective and I'll talk to people around me and to try to bring you you know, my experience to, to bring you the context and perspective for, for what you're seeing. But, but to your point, I think that that's one thing that TV does well. And when you say, I have an immense power, I don't see it as a power, I see it as immense responsibility. Responsibility is a better, right? so, yeah. Because there's a great responsibility to do it right and to, to provide as many viewpoints as possible. So yes. that's the one thing I would say about that. Um, let's talk about CNN now yes. and, and your book. And before we talk about the beginning of CNN and that startup culture, which I loved reading about in your book, because it was so exciting, uh, the thought of the young people coming together and, and scrapping and, and creating this brand new thing. Before we get to that, and before we get to this idea of CNN, the guy who came up with it all, 
this guy, Ted Turner. He's, he's such a grand character. Mm -hmm. uh, many people don't know who he is. Tell us who Ted Turner was. This might be a great time to do it. Yeah, no, and if Kevin has the picture, I would love to show it in case someone watching doesn't know. Uh, yeah, there's Ted Turner. Uh, Ted Turner was one of a kind. There's just no way. Uh, I tried to describe him in the book and I hope I did a good job. People who know him say I did, but but to, what, to know him, you have to see him. He was this incredibly handsome Rhett Butler character, swaggering, politically incorrect, uh, and, and daredevil uh, in, in every sense of the word. And this is a picture of him from his uh, I was cable before cable was cool campaign <laughs> launched uh, several years after CNN did because cable was brand new at that point. But yeah, you know, Frank, Ted Turner uh, made CNN happen, but he also even bigger than CNN and changing the news business, which is a pretty big credit to have, under your belt, he popularized cable in a way uh, at a and at at a time when it wasn't so popular. He basically made the stuff that went on cable that made people want to pay money for television, which up until then they hadn't done. Uh, and yeah, it was a big deal when he made the cover of Time Magazine um, because at that point, up until that point. Most of television in the 70s was dominated by uh, three networks. They were they they were, had the stranglehold on entertainment and news and sports and everything you saw that came into your television. There were in some bigger markets like this the KTLAs of the world that that were independent stations, but it was very hard for them to compete against the networks, um, and ex except, especially outside of this market. So Ted Turner was the guy in Atlanta. He had come from a billboard salesman background. His father had started a billboard company, which he took over as a young man. And that wasn't enough for him. He got into radio, you know, billboards were interesting and he loved selling them, but that wasn't dimensional enough. So he bought into radio stations and radio stations weren't sexy enough for him. And he back ended into this deal where he bought a little crummy left for dead independent television station in Atlanta uh, called W, what that he called WTCG, Turner Communications Group. And basically it was this amazing Petri dish for him. But the one thing he didn't want to put on it was news because he thought news was terrible. News was <laughs> usually bad because often news is not bringing you happy news. It's bringing you bad news or, or something difficult in the community. But also he wanted a counter program to, to the networks. And so, uh, yeah, Ted Turner is, uh, is just a larger in life myth, mythic figure who at that time as a young man was a celebrated yachtsman who literally, I love this story because it, for all of us, it's a reminder that when you live at what moment in time, if you seize that moment, uh, you can make a difference. And he, he really, really did. That's the paperback version of the book that's coming out in May. Um, and I love that picture of Ted because he's in the CNN newsroom uh, not, after, not long after it's launched. And it was just quite an act of heroism that, that he and the 300 or so people who started it got it off the ground. And just also back to your point, what's, I, what I love about the CNN story and just the Ted Turner story generally is it's very rare in our lives that we do get to be part of a startup um, at the start of a medium in particular. And this is all of those things at one time. In 1980, it was cable was just taking over the American uh, television set. It was just beginning to, and and it, it's just this perfect constellation of, of firsts that were all coming together. But for a guy who wasn't a fan of putting TV news on channel 17, which was WTCG, right? It was the UHF channel 17. Yeah. Um, why, how do we get from that guy to, I'm going to start an all news network? So basically it was the perfect moment of opportunism. He had put his little junky UHF station, which was 
rising up in the market. People were interested in watching what he was putting on it, which was some sports, uh, some off network television shows and a lot of movies. He decided that he, he got that station, WTCG, floated over the uh, cable waves around the Southeast region, which gave him a bigger audience. And that sounds kind of humdrum now, but back at that time, the idea that you would have a station in one market that floated outside of that market was huge. So he did that um, all because of the marriage between cable and satellite. So cable was this sleepy kind of utility to get you television into your house if you lived in a place where it, you couldn't get it otherwise. But satellite was a super revolutionary creation um, that had come about in the 60s, but was popularized or becoming more popular in the 70s. And he had this aha moment when he first heard about the capabilities of the satellite to basically shower down across the United, the entire United States and ultimately, of course, the world, a, a television signal that was previously just confined to one particular region. And, and when he had done that with Channel 17, that was exciting. They started to get mail from all around, the, you know, first the region and then eventually the country but he wanted more, that wasn't enough for him. And nothing was ever enough for Ted. He said that his father told him, don't ever set a goal that you can attain because then when you get it, you're gonna be unhappy. And in fact, that's in fact, in fact what happened with his father. So Ted had that always in the top of mind that you never set a goal that you can achieve. And so he saw the, the power of the satellite and the cable married together, which very few people, in fact, almost no one saw then. Uh, and he said, what the heck can I put on this marriage of cable and satellite and, and bring the entire country? He loved sports. He owned the Braves. He owned the Hawks and he had the rights to wrestling. Uh, I believe for a while he also had rights uh, to football too. But he just decided that, that he didn't want to cannibalize those things by putting that on the satellite. And there were these guys looking at starting what now we know as ESPN at the same time. So he just, you know, sitting around with a bunch of his executives thought, what, what can we do with this technology? And literally the thing they decided that they could do, um, what could possibly be 24 hours? Why not news? And he immediately thrust into action, recognizing, and this is another great story for anybody who's in the business world or who wants to go into the business world. He, he recognized he didn't know anything about news. So he went out and started hiring people who did. Um, and they in turn hired the people who engined CNN, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Well, and, and this idea of this guy who, who was saying, you know, why not news? You actually uh, write in your book about, you know, the fact that he went to a cable TV trade show in Anaheim and tried to convince people that, hey, you know, you should put news on on 24 hours a day. And you have the comment of the vice president of planning for The Washington Post summed up how folks felt about that. Quote, the cable industry doubts that Ted Turner knows his ass from a hole in the ground <laughs> about news. Um, and yet somehow he convinced them to do it. And and he decided to push forward. And you mentioned his father, and we should say his father, who had the billboard company, he committed suicide, right? Yes, yes. How did that affect him? Well, of course, that would be devastating. And especially since they were so close and he had both fear and admiration in abundance for his father. His father was also a larger than life personality. Uh, and, and businessman. And, you know, he, in fact, uh, the, the wisdom that he imparted to Ted was something that he hadn't practiced himself. He had said he wanted to create this giant billboard company, and he did, and he was worried about the economics of it. And, of course, there are many other things at play with his mental health, and he, he committed suicide. And Ted was left at age 24 mm -hmm. with this business, uh, his father's associates weren't so sure, in fact, less than weren't so sure. They didn't believe that he could handle it, but uh, he, was, he was convinced that he was going to avenge his father's death. 
And one of the ways he did that was by expanding from billboards into radio and then into this television business. But as you point out, um, because he hadn't done news at this WTCG Channel 17, and because he was a wild, larger than life playboy, and here's where I can you know, tell the story really quickly that basically, Ted was um, not a well-known commodity to the United States at that point, except perhaps uh, you know, he was known in, in the industry, but he was known um, for having, uh, he had the, ba the Braves baseball team and he had these wild, crazy shenanigans to get people in, in the tent, so to speak, into the stadium because the Braves were so bad. Uh, but he was simultaneously an, a world-class yachtsman. And in 1977, he won the America's Cup and very famously appeared on national television to a, a, a received the trophy and basically fell down drunk on the floor because he'd been drinking ever since he'd won an hour or so, a couple hours before. And um, unabashedly so, unapologetically, uh, just, just, you know, he basically later said, what would you have done? You just won the America's Cup. So he was this wild playboy, um, always running around, would go to these conferences and just, you know, scream and shout. He was famous for jumping on people's desks if they wouldn't make an ad buy on his, on his station. So, so he did not have the temperament that was known to be associated with news. Now news is more colorful in many ways and in a much different business. And, and at that point, up until that point, basically news was run by the three networks that were helmed by anchormen who were basically white, older men who were very austere. And so the idea that Ted could you know, pull off this concept of all news, news was something that was somber and serious and, and something that um, only people with you know, certain kinds of, journal, not even journalistic degrees could handle. Um, you know, they'd been out in the field and done all this hard, serious work. And here's Ted saying he wants to do a news business. But the reason he was able to pull it off, Frank, is largely because he had his own money. And at that point, cable was such a pipsqueak. Uh, basically, when CNN launched, there were only 18 million homes that had cable in the whole country. And only 1.2 million cable subscribers, uh, homes that possibly could receive it. So he basically said, you know, damn it, you know, if you don't want to support me, I'm going to do it anyway. And, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes, which is another great lesson. And of course, it's an easy lesson for somebody who's got means to say, um, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and do it and let the market show up later. But it is a great and interesting lesson that he was so tenacious and so focused on what he wanted, that he wasn't going to let the naysayers talk him out of it, even though the naysayers were the people he needed to make it popularized. And, and just so I'm clear, was he driven by the I'm going to show you, or was he driven by some innate knowledge that I can make this work and I can make some money out of this? I think it was both. I, he was the kind of person uh, who basically, if you said, you can't do that. Don't don't go over there. I mean, he was like this when he was a kid too. He was trouble from, from the get-go. If you said, don't cross that street, he'd cross the street. Um, and if you, you, know, you said, don't cross that street, you might might find a you know electric wire on the other side. That made him go even faster. And he was gonna step over that electric wire and not let it get him down. So I, I yes, and I think other than that, he, he was never guided by money the way, um, say, a Rupert Murdoch was. If you read about Rupert Murdoch, you know, he was a, a ruthless businessman from the get-go. Uh, Ted was a little bit more uh, driven by the higher purpose of it all and, and the idea that I'm going to do it if you, even if you told me I couldn't. But he also, you know, saw it as a great business opportunity and it had worked out for him with TCG, you know, this is how junky Channel 17 was. People wouldn't buy ads on it to begin with. So he basically had to give 
adds away <laughs> to people who are selling schlocky stuff like the Ginsu knives or um, one of the most famous things is his super bad party ring. It was like a mood ring. It was, you know, four or five bucks. It was one of those direct mail before people could buy things, you know, as easily as they can through mail order, uh, he, he would just give away ad time to people who were selling schlocky merchandise and take a slice of whatever it was they sold. And so as he was building Channel 17, he knew he was doing well because even though he couldn't sell ads in a conventional way, he was running these ads uh, for schlocky merchandise and they were deluged with mail. So <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't feel like he had to work the conventional route, which I think is another mark of a business person who succeeds. You know, they don't, mm. they're not defined by the margins that are typically presented. So he knew this inside that I, I think I can make money doing this. I'm going to show all you guys, but he still hadn't pulled the trigger you write about this until the general manager of the Atlanta Braves, Bill Lucas, suddenly dies in his early 40s. Yes. And you say that had an effect on Turner about life being short. And yes. that's what made finally said, OK, to him, I, I've got to do this. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yes. Uh, even though he liked to defy the naysayers, he was being cautious. And the death of this man, who was his friend, his untimely death, uh, just kickstarted him literally into seeing that you know, there's no time like now. Uh, if we wait, who knows what will happen? And that was critical, Frank, because if he had waited until the market would bear what he was trying to do, if he had waited till cable was enough of the United States was wired for cable, that there was then in, seen a need for something like what he was proposing, he could very well have been locked out. All the bigger guns could have come along and just broadsided him out of the way. But uh, he listened to his heart. And that is another way that he's different than a lot of business people because he, it was about, you know, he, he needed it to economically add up, but he wasn't afraid to take that risk. And he listened to this inner voice that was uh, triggered by this terrible, terrible loss of a young, a young person in his prime who he really respected. He had put some pieces in place, and, and one of the most important pieces was someone who is a, a central character of your book, a, a pioneer at CNN, uh, someone who is behind the scenes, who people probably have never heard his name, but is so important in the development of CNN. I'm talking about Reese Schoenfeld. Who is Reese Schoenfeld, and how did he contribute to all of this? Yeah, Reese Schoenfeld sadly passed away this past summer. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a veteran newsman who was just waiting for the moment to happen that someone like Ted would arrive because he had spent his whole life on the margins of the news business, not at the networks, looking for a way to take news larger than it was beyond the half hour that was served up by the networks and the other half hour that was served up by local stations and markets around, around the country. He thought that wasn't enough. And so in his wildest dreams, he couldn't have imagined that a guy like Ted Turner would show up and say, hey, let's do this. Uh, but that's what happened. And he, uh, even though they were so completely different personality wise, they both had something that the other needed. Ted had the capital and the gumption. Um, and the you know other resources besides the capital, and Reese had a different sort of gumption and this dream that the world needed to see news like we talked about before, that we saw years before with Kathy Siskis, the little girl in the well in San Marino. He envisioned that news wasn't something that was you know packaged up neatly every night and and presented to you while you were sitting there and eating dinner, nice little news reports, which were similar to what you would read in a newspaper just with pictures and sound. Uh, he envisioned that news would be what we see it is today. You turn it on and you watch it unfold. Now, of course, you know the downside of that is that there isn't always something going on that you want to watch. We can talk about that later on, but his in his dream, 
there would be this mechanism that would allow for that to happen. And um, there was Ted with this, with this opportunity. So he said, yes. There's a difference between vision and execution. And yes. it's one thing to have that vision and even to get uh, Reese Schoenfeld to sign on to that vision. But then you've got to hire folks who will execute that vision. And that literally was from the ground up, from finding a place to house it, to building the sets, to wiring the place, to figuring out how it's all going to work. And who are the core people who are hired? How many people? And then describe that exciting startup culture that, that, I, that, that we get to read about in your book. And it all happened in a year about a year, um, less actually. So yes, it was all those things. And with this crazy timetable uh, that especially then was unimaginable. Uh, there were so many great people who aided and abetted Reese in, in making this happen. Many of them were young people just out of school because there was no union in Atlanta where the headquarters was. And they, you know, they needed many people to get it off the ground, willing to work overnight and willing to work for basically what amounted to what was at the time the minimum wage, which was three bucks or something an hour. Um, and people were in fact willing to pick up and move to Atlanta, which was not the world-class media capital that it has become. It was kind of a sleepy big Southern town. And it certainly wasn't a place known for its media, you know, as an epicenter of the media. And he basically uh, managed to wrangle an old country club that had been left for dead, that was filled with vagrants. Um, and, and his folks rewired it and turned it into this magnificent you know, palace of news. It was unlike anything anybody had ever seen before. It also had the property to have enough satellite dishes on the grounds, which at that time was unprecedented. And among his chief people who he hired or who Reese hired, because Ted really basically had nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operations of it because he knew that wasn't his thing, was a man named Ted Kavanaugh, who may actually be on this call. Um, Ted Kavanaugh, Mad Dog Kavanaugh, was a veteran of um, independent news in New York. And he was a pistol-wearing cowboy of a guy um, from the Bronx. And he was a wonderful figure. You couldn't have made someone up as wonderful as he was. Very dashing, handsome man with a fabulously focused vision and passion for the news. And so they, they crewed up. Uh, you know, they found people like you who were at the beginning stages of their career, who were willing to take the risk to move to Atlanta to be on the air. Um, there was no shortage of people who wanted to do that, but finding good people who were willing to do that for this wacky upstart was, was tough. And then um, young producers, young, um, they called them VJs, video journalists, who basically did everything from lay cable to run a teleprompter. And uh, they all came together. And what's so cool about it is that for the weeks, the six or eight weeks before they launched, they were working like crazy doing tests and, you know, run throughs. And then they'd go out and party all together. You know, no, no class system. I'm experienced. You're not. They'd all go out and hang out and uh, wild shenanigans. And then on June 1st, 1980, it was off to the races and the shena shenanigans were dialed down by the fact that now some people were working overnight, some people were working weekends um, and they, they were all working in the service of, of putting news on the air for the very first time all the time, which as we keep saying was not, uh, it was so, it was like going to the moon, it was that, radical an idea. Nobody believed that anyone would want to watch this. Uh, the people who were making it weren't even so sure that anybody would want to watch this. Uh, they just knew that they wanted to see if it would work. And many of them weren't so sure, even up until the moment that it went on the air, that they were going to be able to pull it off. Because it really kept going back to this question of, what will we put on the air all the time? There isn't that much news. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And, what, and so they finally put the pieces in place to the extent possible during that, that year run up. They're ready to go. The lights come on. Someone counts them down three, two, one. They point to who, what is said, how does it come on the air? And then what happens in those first few days? Well, basically it looked, you know, it was pretty underwhelming because when they said go, it was a husband wife anchor duo who rode their career out up in Sacramento after spending years at CNN and later at CNBC, uh, Dave Walker and Lois Hart. Uh, basically they were sitting there. Um, someone said go, they started reading the news. There were several live shots that they had lined up to show off the live technology. One was even all the way from Jerusalem, which at that time was a remarkable feat. Um, there was breaking news. President Carter was visiting Vernon Jordan in the hospital. He had just been shot a few days before. They were updating on the recovery of the civil rights leader. Uh, and uh, basically, there was absolutely nothing remarkable about it. It looked like a newscast. And if you, if you dialed it up on YouTube, and you can, um, you would find absolutely nothing unusual about the actual hour and hours that followed. But what was remarkable was that it was happening and that they managed after many missteps um, in the year before, a satellite went missing, Ted Turner went missing at sea. There's a lot of drama behind um, the launch of the, of the network that we're not talking about, which is good because that means hopefully you'll read the book. But it, it basically uh, was so improbable that, that they'd split the switch that by the time they did, uh, you know, it was, it was so um, anticlimactic. So, and, and, and no one was really watching. That's <laughs> what I was going to ask you. How many people were actually watching this anticlimactic, uh, everyday kind of newscast? More people have probably watched it on YouTube since, <laughs> in, the, in the 40 years since, that people watched it at that moment. And that's the other thing I love about this story is, you know, we live in a world where there are startups and we love these IPOs and all these companies come into being. And, you know, it's like the restaurant on the corner that, you think is okay and somehow manages to last until your kids go off to college and nobody nobody knows how it became a hit or nobody imagines that there was ever a time that it wasn't there mm -hmm. and that's how it was with with this nobody knew if it was going to keep going and there was no way to measure how many people were watching because it just literally measuring cable uh, cable audience at that point was just not possible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and there were only 1.2 million homes wired. In fact, this is how crazy it was, Frank, in New York and Washington, D.C., and I believe a lot of L.A. I'm not, I haven't, I haven't ever looked into it. In New York and, and Washington, D.C., the media power centers of the world, nobody could see it because the, it just wasn't carried there. <laughs> so <laughs> even in the first year, um, or more in Washington, where the Washington, you know, vaunted Washington press corps was, which, you know, engines so much of the news that we see now, people could not see it. Ted Turner was actually buying satellite dishes for uh, the Capitol and for the White House because he wanted them to be able to watch his network. That's wow. how, that's how unwired the nation was for cable. So, Amen. yeah. It was, it, no one knew when it launched that it, that it could last a year, much less 40. Yeah. Much I less it would have the impact that it did. Right. Um, and, and actually we should say January CNN was the highest rated of the cable news networks, dethroning Fox for the first time in, in, in a long time. Long time. And yeah. investing MSNBC. Um, many people sort of got to CNN or, or talked about, oh, CNN made it onto the map with the Gulf War, with the boys in Baghdad, as they used to call them, the, uh, the, the men uh, who are uh, Shaw, Holloman, um, uh, you know, they're all hunkered down. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, gosh, I Arnett. forgot. Arnett, Peter yeah. Arnett, right. Mm -hmm. They're all hunkered down as the, the bombs are going off in Baghdad. This was uh, the first time around. Um, and, but you write in your book that it was actually an, another event uh, that happened before the Gulf War that really put CNN on the map. What was that? Yeah, it was actually, 
it, I'll answer your question, but I'll also broaden it out to something that just happened a couple of weeks ago. There was another little girl who fell into a well in Midland, Texas in 1987. And that's when CNN got its highest ratings in its existence up until that point, um, because people were riveted as they had been decades before. Uh, thankfully, this story had a happy outcome because the girl was rescued, but people, all eyes were on Midland, Texas, in Midland, Texas, and even the networks, uh, you know, which normally would have kind of poo-pooed this human interest story about some little girl nobody knew in Midland, Texas. They even sent crews there, um, well, more than sent crews there, they stayed on the air live until she was retrieved from the well. But Frank, you know, I was thinking recently about, you know, there were other things that happened in the 80s that, that trained people the way you may remember when you first got your smartphone before you were texting. You're cool. So you were probably texting before everybody else oh. was. But remember, we had to all learn how to use SMS, it was called then texting. You know, it was strange the first time you got one. Like, yeah. that's why, you know, now, of course, that's how people communicate. They don't even want to talk by phone. But um, it was the same thing with cable in that as CNN came into existence in, in the 80s or, or went online in the 80s, cable was spreading out around the country. And the more people who got on cable, the more people who watched it. And, you know, they were flipping around and they're like, hmm, wow, what's that? That's an anchor person. That person's live. Let me keep watching. I didn't really like the news before, but I'll just keep watching because it was background noise. And then the shuttle challenger would happen. Um, this is also, of course, I have to point out that people weren't, um, screens weren't ubiquitous now. You know, you didn't go to the doctor's office and have a screen or a bar or you know, not that anyone goes to a bar right now, but you know, the screens yeah. were not ubiquitous. People weren't sitting at home with a television <coughs> set on. Um, but, but when they did have the television set on, they had this news. But the the reason I want to correct what I wrote in the book about the little girl in the well in 1987, which was indeed the highest rated uh, news story at that point in, in, in CNN's history, is that when Larry King died a few weeks ago, I realized I sold him short in this book because the truth is that when Larry King was hired in 1985, he really put CNN on the map for a lot of people. Up until that point, you know, you might still not be very interested in the daily news, or you might tune in for a half hour of news the way you would have on the networks. But when Larry King got hired to be the talk show host, um, at I think it was at 10 when he first started, and then it moved to nine. He basically, he wasn't famous. He wasn't Larry King, I mean, he was known for his radio work. When he was hired to be on CNN to replace the woman who had been hired as the initial talk show host, he really drew a lot of attention um, to the network that, that would not have come or would have taken years to come otherwise. So it's important to give him props, yeah. the, late, the late Larry King. But yeah, so it was a series of events, a series of news events that made people start to go, hmm, you know, maybe it is interesting to watch the news, but it was a slow evolution um, over the course of those 15 years or 16 years before Fox even and, and MSNBC came along and changed everything. And we're going to talk for a few more uh, moments, and then I, I, I do want to invite people to, to send us some questions, and we want to do some Q&A uh, with some of our, our webinar viewers, so, so they'll pose some questions to you as well, Lisa. But um, Ted Turner, as he, you know, to me, seemed like such a brilliant guy, even as when I was a young man and, and he was starting this, I thought, man, what a, a great thing that he's doing, and you know, I was a news junkie, even as a high school kid and thinking, I'm going to work there someday. Mm. And I eventually did work there. And you work there as well. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, before I, I get to Ted Turner and your, your thoughts on the workplace culture that I want to ask you about. Um, tell me about your personal experience going to intern in the New York Bureau of, of CNN. And because I think it speaks to what it was like in the office back then, because now you go to Columbus circle and you look up and there's the big CNN 
building and tower. I worked at Five Penn Plaza across from Madison Square Garden, which was still kind of a dump. And now it's this big fancy place. But you worked in a place where it wasn't fancy at all. No, and it was before, it was so uncompetitive and they were so desperate for bodies that I was basically, I had heard that it existed. I couldn't see it because as I say, New York where I grew up was not wired. I was home one summer for, from college working in a video store, if anybody remembers those, to make money in the summer. And I ran into a high school classmate who told me that in the base of the World Trade Center, there was this cool looking news thing. And he remembered that I, like you, I grew up wanting to be a journalist and I had no idea, earthly idea, how I was going to do it. And he said, you should call them up. They're called Cable News Network. So I got to the video store and I picked up the phone and I dialed information, which was the way you found a phone number out back then. And it was pricey. And I called on the work phone and asked for Cable News Network's number and called them. I was not the most brave person. So this was a big deal. And the guy who answered the phone basically said, you know, desk, meaning the assignment desk. And uh, I told him who I was and what I wanted. And he said, come on in tomorrow for an internship, <laughs> which is just so comical now because people <laughs> fall all over themselves to right. get an internship doing anything at CNN. And I, he, when I showed up, he didn't even, I'm sure he didn't even remember having talked to me the day before. And basically I wound up working for various people who of course needed free labor who doesn't love free labor, but that's how loose the whole place was. It, it was kind of crazy. I wanna hear, I, I don't know exactly how, I know that you worked at CNN, but I can't remember how you got in the door. Cause by the right, time so you got in the door, it was much different and you got on in as on the air, which is a whole different. It was, it was very different. By the time I got there, it was a proper company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I did work with the guy who picked up the phone and hired you, Richard Roth, who's the longtime UN correspondent. His office was next to mine in New York. But I was hired, I was working as a reporter here at, at KCAL in Los Angeles. I'd worked here for seven years as a reporter and, and then had an opportunity to go to CNN and, and you know how those things work with your agent or whoever. And they, you know, they have you out and you interview and and so I was hired by a guy named Keith McAllister, who was the bureau chief. And one of the questions I asked him was, you know, are you, you know, how, how long will you be here? Are you, you're not going anywhere, right? And no, 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 I'm, I'm a New York, you know, native and I, I plan to stay here for a long time. I think within six months, he had left the New York bureau, but he had actually, he got kicked upstairs. He became a, the managing editor for, for domestic news in Atlanta. So actually that helped, that helped me in, in th throughout my period at CNN because he knew my work and, and trusted me. And, and so I, that's how I got hired there. And do you um, remember at the time how many reporters there were even just in the, in the New York Bureau? Well, we had, my, uh, we had Richard, Maria Inojosa was there, um, Jeannie Mos, uh, Deborah Farrick. Um, Maybe there was one other person, but uh, that was, uh, there were four or five of us. And, and that was in the bureau, obviously right. the, the FN financial news had, had its whole team um, led by Lou Dobbs and, um, and, and others. Uh, and so that was a whole different floor. And I know we really didn't go visit with those folks, but um, yeah, it was, so by then it was a, a news operation um, and then, um, yeah, and then they moved over to one, I came back to the LA Bureau mm -hmm. and then they moved to their fancy digs over in the Columbus Circle. The reason I ask is because when CNN launched, there were, I can't remember how many uh, proper reporters there were in the bureaus, but there was one reporter in Atlanta who was sent, Mike Betcher, if people yeah. know his, he, he was it, that was it. And he was so thrilled to get the job of course, you know, he wanted, he was in Oklahoma and uh, there was a contingent of producers from Oklahoma, but yeah, there were not a lot of proper reporters per se at the very beginning. So yeah, yeah by the time you got there, it was a whole different ecosystem. So. Um, so let me get to that workplace culture issue because I think things have changed so much in the news industry in, in so many ways and workplace culture is one of them. You talked about the fact that Ted Turner used to get up on desks and, and when he was selling 
the thing. You know, I came up in a, a business where uh, I had a, a news anchor when I was uh, a news intern, a writing intern at KNX News Radio when I was in college. I would write the copy for the for the anchors on the weekends, and I got into an argument with a, a one of the anchors who said, basically told me to shut up because, and he said, because you're whale shit, because <laughs> nothing nothing is lower than whale shit. Whale shit floats to the bottom of the ocean and you're an intern, so you're whale shit, so shut up. And, you know, at the time you just sort of, it was part of a give and take. Um, yeah. You know, that's just, it was part of the business. Pete Noyes, uh, rest his soul, who just passed away, uh, a legend in, in our business here in Los Angeles. He famously would get up on desks and get into people's faces and tell people how it is or how he felt about their work. Today, we don't really do that. Right. When we're dissatisfied with someone. We say, gosh, it'd be nice if you do it this way. This would be better for me. Um, or you go through someone else and, and try to do it in a way that makes sure that we don't ruffle feathers or, or upset people. Right. Tell me about that workplace culture at CNN and how it was not that at all under Ted Turner. And then the second part of that question is, was Ted Turner a good guy? Hmm. Is he a good guy? I mean, now he's older, but at that point in his life, was he a good guy? Well, I spent a lot of time talking to people. I did not talk to Ted because he is ill. Mm -hmm. um, and there is so much that, so much that he's left behind um, in terms of video and books and, 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 and interviews. So I got a really colorful portrait of him from all of those sources. Uh, people who worked for him at Channel 17 in particular had an unbelievable affection for him. The place sounded like one step removed from a frat house. Um, there was sex, there was drugs, there was you know, drinking. Um, it was so, it would be shut down within seconds if you even thought to run a business the way that business ran back then. And by the way, anybody who's old enough to remember working then will, you know, look, Mad Men is all about that, right? That whole workplace culture where there was inequity and um, abuse and uh, on every single level. Um, so it's not to glorify it, but back in, in, if you talk to people who worked at Channel 17 in particular, and, and the folks who work, worked especially in those early launch days of CNN, um, literally, as I mentioned, Mad Dog Kavanaugh had a gun strapped to his shin when he came to work. I mean, imagine that now, he didn't take it out and use it on anybody, but he was, you know, this old guard New York newsman and they carried guns, he wasn't alone. So the idea that people were abusive the way you describe or, you know, used language that you would never imagine using now or, um, the whole sexual openness, you know, there, or some might say abuse, but none of what I heard was abuse. It was just craziness, basically. Uh, that was sort of the mainstay culture of many a newsroom. I worked in a newsroom in North Carolina where I used to make a little chart of all of us who'd been married to each other. And I mean, married, like not just going out on dates, but like people who had been married and then divorced and then married the other person. So, so the culture was so completely different than we think of it is today. And because of that, there was this sense of course, I'm sure there were many people who felt marginalized by it. Um, there was a huge diversity issue. If you go back and look at newsrooms back then, you know, historically over time, people of color have been marginalized and women have been marginalized. That's what my next book is about. But, um, but people, just to your question, seem to have so much fun. So many people told me that this moment of their life was the time of their lives, you know, not just because they were young and starting out and not just because they were building this new thing that happened to have changed the news business and changed their lives, but it was the sort of aggregate of all those things, this excitement. Um, nobody was making, few people were making much money. Um, most people were just scraping it together and working punishing hours, but there was something about that spirit that coasted them into creating what they created. And a lot of people will tell you that about a lot of creative 
ven ventures or, or even not necessarily creative ventures, just a startup venture. Um, as to whether Ted was a good guy, he's a complicated guy. And as Kevin pointed out in the beginning, I wrote a book about Ray Kroc, who was not a nice man. He was also revered by the people who worked for him. Um, but I never got the sense that outside of the circle of people who worked closely for him, that people had this reverence for him. But Ted, Ted was the kind of guy, he drove a beat up old car and he would drive out of channel 17 and he'd see a, a worker at the station standing on the bus stop waiting to take the bus home. And again, Atlanta was not a place where you wanted to take a bus back then if you could avoid it, because it wasn't like they came every five minutes, you know, and got you where you were going. And Ted would stop and pick the guy up and drive him wherever he needed to go. And he, he had this crazy party streak, um, but he, the people around him just respected the mission and uh, whatever that mission was, it was this you know, service of the station. And they just, they loved working for him and they're so grateful. There was a call a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you were on it. I should have sent it to you just in case you're not on this list. There's this new CNN Alumni Association and uh -huh. Ted came on the call. Oh, he um, did. Yes, he did. And it was just oh. a little, but you couldn't see him. And, you know, the poor guy, he is, he has dementia. And, huh. you know, if you've seen the Jane Fonda documentary, he's not well, but he came on the call and just the word Turner on the Zoom call with whatever it was, 800 people from oh. every step of the way of CNN's existence from the very beginning till, you know, recent. And he's there. And just the vision of the word Turner, people just went crazy because they they feel rightfully so that they owe their careers to him if he hadn't started cnn who knows what would have happened to them someone would have started it like mcdonald's somebody would have done it but it might not have been at that moment in time and so there's this this love and reverence for him and now there's this movement to get him immortalized with the journalism scholarship which frankly i find kind of funny because he's would be the first person to say that he wasn't a journalist. But, right. So. Well, and, and I, I think to your point, you used the word mission. And I, I felt that when I was there and I, that there was this sense of mission that we felt that we were doing something important. Mm -hmm. We were trying to cover the news in a way that was unbiased, um, that, um, and we did it still, even though we were all making you know, proper wages by the time I got there, it was still on the cheap in many ways compared to the big three networks. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I felt that sense of mission and, I, and I, I still have friends at CNN. I, I think you do as well. I still feel that sense of mission amongst the, the workforce. Obviously at the personality level, it's become a, a different animal, especially in prime time and and the, the personality anchors that they have now are encouraged to express themselves. And there's, there isn't the sort of news gathering which trumped that sort of thing in the past. Yes. You know, when I was there, the news mattered more than the personalities. We used to say the news was the star. I think that's, that's changed a bit, but I do think that the workforce is still such that um, you know, there, there are, people with living that, that mission. Um, Lisa, you know, we, I've taken way too much time because I do want to leave some time for Q and A. Yes. There, there are questions and Kevin, do you, do you want to read the questions to Lisa? Sure. Not, not a problem. I'll read okay. you the first question. Okay. Um, the first question is from one of our uh, viewers. Did the 24 hour news cycle change the culture of local news reporting? Hmm. I'll let you answer that Can well i i think it did um i think that what the, the local news in the past um was much more it was closer to news of the day in the way that evening news used to be done that it, that is that a reporter would go out cover a story marinate in that story and then put together a minute 40, two and a half minutes, whatever it was at the end of the day that sort of summarized all of it. I think local news today, because we are on the air all the time, especially when it comes to a breaking news story, but you know, KTLA, we sign on at 4 a.m. 
we go off, I think at 2 p.m. for an hour. And then we're back on with new local news at three o'clock. I believe there's another little break before we come back on at 5.30 or six. It's, it's constant. And then you go over to KCAL, they're on in prime time. And it's, it's a constant, we used to call it feeding the beast at CNN, where you had to feed that beast, which was hungry for news stories. And in local news, we've jumped on that treadmill as well. But that's only, that's been a gradual kind of evolution, hasn't it, right? I mean, you feel like you've had to do it or if somebody feels like it has to happen. I, th- I think it, 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 to. it the, one of the drivers for it, frankly, is the economics of it. While it is expensive to have a proper news organization, it is much cheaper than running, uh, you know, a package of Seinfeld, you know, to, to purchase syndication or to purchase original production is much more expensive than it is to create a news organization that can then produce hours and hours of news. And so every hour that you produce that cost per hour go, goes down. Right. And so I think that's part one of the drivers of why local news has expanded uh, at, at stations. It's a high profit, low cost relatively mm-hmm. um, product. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we see so much of it, but you know, it is it is influenced by this idea that you you have to go live. You know, you, you we don't put together as many taped pieces as we used to. Right. You know, and people can argue whether that's better or not, but it, that's just a fact today. I think we go do a lot more live coverage. We take people to the scene. Here's what's going on right now. It may be a shorter snippet of the news, maybe less perspective, and we expect that you'll get that in other ways. In that sense, that's exactly what Reese Schoenfeld's vision was back back then. Yeah, back when CNN launched was that's how news should be presented is not packaged up, but evolved. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. We've got another question here. Um, how do you view how allowing the wealthy to closely control massive profit-driven media empires especially following the Telecommunications Act of 1996, has affected free press, checks on power, and driven feedback loops in what is covered. Lisa, I'll let you take that. (laughs) That's such a simple question. Um, That's an excellent question. And I hope you'll read both this book and my next book, which is about the creation of public broadcasting, which was in response, I mean, it's much more than the creation of public broadcasting, but it's how public broadcasting was in response to uh, commercial control of the public airwaves. And um, yeah, wow, that is such a fabulous and dense question. I, I honestly don't think I could possibly even begin to address it here, but I'm happy if you wanna write me an email to engage with you on it, because I do find that subject fascinating. Um, it's, uh, we would be in a whole different planet, on a whole different planet, if we lived in a place like Britain, uh, which of course everything's changed there too, where television is licensed, literally. I mean, you're married to a Brit, you can talk about this better than I can, but the whole ecosystem, media ecosystem is completely different outside of this country in, in other places. And that's completely affected how it's controlled and disseminated to the people. And yeah, 1996 is when uh, the internet was really getting hot, the web was created and that all changed everything, all hell broke loose. But yeah, I, I'm- I think, it's a, I think it's a really good question. And I think there is some merit to, to the, what I think is a, a thesis and a, a theory there that this idea that the wealthy do um, be, because the wealthy own the means of production in terms of news. Um, there is this feedback loop that does take place. The hope is, and, and I believe that this does happen, that there are people within that news organization who are not, I don't consider myself wealthy. I, you know, I'm doing okay, but I'm not a wealthy guy who I don't own the place. And I see it as one of my responsibilities to make sure that we do disrupt that 
that feedback loop, that we do talk about the things that are happening in our community, um, that the different points of view. But having said that, I do believe that the economics do drive a lot of it. There's so much of the programming that we see everywhere and including in news that is driven by how many eyeballs are we going to get? Can we get more people to watch us instead of them? Now that doesn't mean we're not covering a story inaccurately or we're not doing that story in a way that's not truthful, but it does come down to what is the story selection? And you know, to get really deep, you know, right now we're in a, in a situation, for example, when, in which, um, you know, because of the pandemic, because of uh, mental illness, because of drugs, because of uh, the, the lack of affordable housing, we have a homeless crisis in Southern California, not just Southern California, but we see it every day. We cover it, but most of us don't experience it. Right. I don't have any personal experience with living on the street or having to, you know, uh, surf couches from one friend to another. And that's another segment of the homeless society or community. Um, and so if we were experiencing that more personally, I think we would cover it more. We, we experience it by driving past it. And so I do think there is something to this idea that people who are of a certain means setting the agenda, there is a, I think feedback loop is, is one way to describe it. And it's, I'm just touching the surface, but I do think there is something to the question. Well, and I, I to your eloquent answer, let me just add too that rules were put in place as broadcasting was established and grew and grew that were meant to govern that that there even that even news would exist. Um, you know, you couldn't have a broadcast license unless you put some news on the air and public affairs and reflected what was going on in your community. And there were, you know, there still are mechanisms by which you can challenge a television station um, and a radio station and say you're not reflecting the community around you. But it's just it, it's so complex that it. But yeah. Yeah. But it is, it is, there it is, have been efforts to to offset the fact that that the ownership of the media has fallen into the hands of first just rich people, mostly men, and then beyond rich people, conglomerates. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we have a time for a couple more questions. Um, one question here: How much do we blame Ted Turner and CNN? for creating Fox News Network? Hmm. I think, you know, it's not their, his fault that they created it. Somebody saw it, a, a, you know, first of all, MSNBC came before Fox and it was created as America's talking by the same man who created Fox, Roger Ailes, who by the way, years before had worked with a bunch of early CNNers um, long before CNN was a concept on another, basically conservative news service. It wasn't an all news channel, it was just a service. So, you know, to blame Ted, it's certainly, you know, mimicry is the highest form of flattery and Rupert Murdoch is a whole other many years long conversation and how he built his empire um, is fascinating. And it, there's absolutely no question that he started 24 hour news. And actually at one point, almost bailed Ted out many years, a couple of years into CNN when Ted was financially in trouble, Rupert was swirling around and just dipping into the United States and looked at possibly investing in, in Ted. He didn't obviously, but um, you know, certainly a great idea spawned another idea, um, a version of that idea. And it, it indelibly influenced not just the media, but all of society. Curious what Frank says about that. But. Well, I I think it's it's competition, and I think competition is a good thing. And you know, uh, Lachlan Murdoch just said the other day that he believes that that the news consumer tends to be center right. Obviously, many people believe it's center left mm -hmm. or just center. Um, and to your point earlier about 
media ownership in overseas. My wife is British. And so when you pick up the newspaper there, you know that the sun is right-leaning or that the Times, that's a right-leaning paper. You know, the Guardian is left-leaning. You know that that's sort of the editorial policy of whatever paper you're picking up, the independent is suburb, you know, it speaks to the middle class mm -hmm. um, concerns. And so you kind of know what you're getting when you open the paper. TV is still, at least for the BBC, right down the middle, or so they would say. Um, I don't know, you know, I came up in the do your best to be unbiased and be a professional and tell the story straight. I, I, I'm, I'm not bothered when I go to England and read different forms of media that are leaning in different directions. It doesn't concern me. I, I actually like the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, I think Fox News, what, what I don't appreciate about Fox News today is that the perpetuation of uh, false stories and, and things that were not true. And, you know, we can, we don't need to relitigate the, the election, but right. the president, you know, was constantly telling false stories about, especially about the election and the outcome of the election and Fox amplified those stories. Eventually, the, you know, it has lost audience because they've turned away from Fox because Fox then said, well, actually President Trump lost and they've, they've lost a lot of audience since then. So it's a complex question, but yes, I think Ted Turner spawned Fox News ultimately and Fox News and, and, and Ted Turner spawned MSNBC. It's a good thing. I like more news rather than less. So that's a, a long answer to what I should have said. Thank maybe. you. We have about 10 minutes left. We have a question here. What advice would you give young aspiring journalists today sharing the wisdom of your experiences? You want to go first? Different. It's very different than when you all started, right? I, I would say that, that yes, the business is very different than, than when I started, but the basics are the same in that, you know, I, if I was hiring someone, I would want them to be well-read. I would want them to know, to, to read the paper every day. And when I say paper, obviously you can read it electronically, but I want them to have a breadth of knowledge. And I want them to know how to write because if you don't know how to write, you're not gonna, you're not gonna know how to communicate a story. And, and, and how do you learn how to write? Well, you write. So you, you, know, you put in your 10,000 hours, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, to learn your craft and become an expert at something. You know, I've been doing this since I was 17 years old in my hometown where I started working at my local radio station. I worked all through college. I did print internships, radio, and TV. And so when I went to work in local TV out of college, I could write a story. I could report a story. I wasn't great at it. I was still learning, but I would say those things are important. Read a lot, learn how to write. If you're going into TV news, Watch a lot of TV news. Mm -hmm. If you want to work for NPR, listen to NPR. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to write for the LA Times, read the LA Times and the New York Times and whatever other papers and online publications you can. Soak up information and then learn how to communicate that information and do it over and over again until you're, you feel confident. Yes. That's my advice. And I'd add to that, anybody who isn't endlessly curious and willing to work like mad, it's not a, it's not a good profession for, for those people. But if you love it, uh, you'll find a way to do it. Just meet as many people as you possibly can and do and, as much as you possibly can, like Frank is saying. And the great thing is, I, I, and I want to speak to young people in particular who may not have any contacts who, you know, I didn't know anybody when I started in this field. I didn't know a soul. I, I got lucky in high school and had a chance to work at my local high school, or not even the high school, it was the local radio station doing color commentary on high school football games. <laughs> and I, and I, I transformed that into a weekend 
DJ job. And then I became eventually the news director of that radio station. Wow. By the time I was this, you know, the summer of my senior year of high school. And, and then I learned other things as I went. And as I was going down the road, I was applying for awards and scholarships and meeting people along the way. And one of the things when I would win a scholarship or an award, and I would say, apply for as many as you can, um, thank the people who, who said, yes, you, we're gonna give you $500 or $1,000. That's how I got into USC. Mm. I was a student, I started my college career at Cal Poly Pomona. It was what my parents could afford. I won a scholarship from the Radio and TV News Association of Southern California, the Jim Zalian Scholarship named after a legendary KNX uh, newsman, Jim Zaley. And I've, I sent thank you notes to all of the people on the committee. One of them was a Professor Murray Fromson, a former CBS News correspondent, the late Murray Fromson. And, uh, and so I, I wrote Murray a thank you note and, and Murray said, hey, you know, I, I, I know you, you're, I was in the process of transferring to UCLA. I'd been accepted to UCLA. I said, why are you going to UCLA? Well, I, that's what we can afford is UCLA. Well, why, why haven't you applied at USC? Well, you know, it seemed inconceivable that I would go to USC. Uh, my father was a, a, a corpsman in the Navy, you know, an enlisted man for 30 years. It just didn't seem like it was something that I could even do. And he said, apply. I will make sure that your application gets to the right people and we'll make sure that you have the money to to attend. Wow. And that's how I got into USC. And so the lesson there is, you know, to be um, polite, to have proper manners, to be grateful, and to send thank you notes, um, you know, in addition <laughs> to putting in the work. First and foremost, put in the work. It's great. Thank you. All right, we've got time for one last question. We got about five minutes left here. It's kind of a general one, but I think it's, it's going to be a, a good one to close on. What do you too view as the real challenges of CNN and other mass media in this 21st century? That's another, another thesis or, or 12 right yeah. there, right? Well, if, yeah, if, if, if I may, one of the things is the recent kind of worldwide attack on journalism and the idea of targeting journalists as the enemy. That's something our previous administration did quite a good job of. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of moving forward? Because it's really not just the United States, it's worldwide that that's, that's going on. You know, I, I think media literacy is so important. I think from an early age, we need to explain to people uh, what Frank does every single day and why the news and what they do at KTLA and other news outlets is so important and essential to society. Um, I think if we start there, which of course is not easy to do, uh, then we can educate people on the importance of having the fourth estate as the press is known in balancing out and rooting out and, and watchdogging the government and, and being part of a civil society. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. And of course it's devastating to watch what's happened. And if I knew how to fix it, I, Frank, ha what have you thought as you've been under attack these last few years, or not you personally, but do you have any wisdom about, pithy wisdom about it? Because it's- well, a I, would, I would say a couple of things. One, we have to keep doing better and we have to remember what our mission is. And remember, it's not about us, it's about them. It's about serving our communities and our readers and our viewers and our listeners first and foremost, and stop and take ourselves out of it to the extent we can. Yeah. Um, there's a place for it. And, you know, we, on our morning show, for example, a lot of our show is our personality, but we, the way we approach it is if we get the news right, that gives us a right to play a little bit. And our audience understands who we are as people that Frank may make a joke with Sam or ad lib something with Mark about the weather and they may be having a silly discussion about this, that or the other, but they know when there's a hard news story or something they need to know, I actually give a damn about it and that I'm doing my best. And, and I think that's what 
the challenges for journalists to keep focused, to, to realize what we do and that it still matters. Um, I think that the, the broader question for these news organizations is how do you do it and make money? And especially for newspapers, newspapers are going away. They, they just are. News organizations are not going away. And so how do we keep those going? And how do we as a society educate people to say, look, this matters. It, you get better news from an LA Times or a New York Times or a Washington Post where you have experts and professional journalists who are, this is their life's work to do, to cover the news for you, not for them, for you. Mm -hmm. and, and to get people to understand that, that, that the quality of that news story is more important than the quality of, forgive me, a YouTuber who has not trained, has not spent time and, and doesn't have the seriousness always. Now I'm not speaking, I shouldn't have even said that, but I, I'm just sort of speaking in, in broad terms. Someone who may do it as a casual money-making venture to say, here's something that I, I think is the news and here's my perspective on it. Great, that's a, that's a voice at the table. But if you want real news, if you want someone who has tried to bring their professionalism, their training to bear, to talk, to bring other points of view into the conversation, I still think it's important that we support these news organizations. Even if we don't buy a piece of paper with writing on it, we have to support these news organizations because they are so important, more important than ever. Thank you both. We really appreciate it. I just want to remind folks um, this spring, uh, Ms. Napoli's book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki will be coming out. Please keep an eye out for it. I'm going to leave the chat up after we are done here so people can get the link to Frank's uh, Inside California Politics, which is on Sunday, and information for Lisa so you all can go to the chat room. I want to thank both of you very much for spending your time with us and sharing your views on journalism in the future. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having fun. us. It was Absolutely. fun to see you, Frank. Thanks, Thanks for what you guys are doing. All right, folks, go ahead and cut, cut and paste that information in the chat room. And, and uh, thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Thank right. you. Be safe, everyone. Have All a right. good night. Bye-bye now.